I'm Lori with the Conscious Leadership Academy, and today I am really excited to talk to you about Breath, The New Science of the Lost Art by James Nestor. This book is full of stories from the past, stories about the author's adventures, and stories of amazing examples of the healing power of breathing. I'm just going to cover the main points, so I really encourage you to pick up a copy and read this book for yourself. As always, I'm going to use the author's words as much as I can. This book talks about how we breathe. Essentially, it's about how we breathe wrong. We breathe in ways that contribute to a myriad of our health problems, from congestion to snoring and sleep apnea to high blood pressure and asthma. It's all connected to breath. So author James Nestor went on his own breathing crusade to learn about the lost art of breathing and how we can restore our wellness through the way we take in air. James Nestor began this adventure to heal and restore his own body. He had chronic sinus congestion, several dental issues requiring braces, retainers, and headgear. His labored breathing continued into his 30s, so he set out on a journey to understand how he could help himself, and he explored ancient breathing techniques from the Greeks to the Buddhists to Native Americans. He researched and sought out pulmonots in Russia, Germany, and current scientists at Harvard and Stanford as he presents how breathing can be profoundly beneficial to our health. Take in a breath right now and consider this. The air that's passing down through your throat and into your lungs and bloodstream contains more molecules of air than all the grains of sand on all the world's beaches. That's a lot going into our bodies. The way we take it in and the quality of that air matters. So right at the start of the book, we learn that we breathe wrong, essentially, because our human head has developed in ways that are bad for breathing. The short answer is we should be breathing through our nose, yet so many of us breathe through our mouths. This is kind of a double whammy for us because not only then are we not getting the benefit of breathing through our noses, getting cleaner, more purified air into our bodies, but breathing through our mouth is the single biggest predictor of teeth cavities and dental problems. So how did this happen to us? Well, about 800,000 years ago, we began tenderizing food and then we began cooking it. So this process meant more calories could be digested and so our bodies began drawing in more energy from our food. With that extra energy, our brains began to grow even larger. And as we developed speech, the larynx descended down into the throat. Bigger brains, lower larynxes had certain evolutionary advantages, but they did come at a cost. Our expanding brains pushed our sinuses into smaller and smaller spaces, making our airways smaller, and our noses more prominent. We did okay for a while, but then 300 years ago, the Western diet drastically changed. We began processing our food, and our diets became even softer. Because we did not chew as much, our mouth did not grow as big, which caused a big rise in orthodontic and breathing problems. And the result was we began breathing more through our mouths. You probably don't know that the nose does far more than you might realize. It doesn't just take in air, but it cleans the air out, it heats it, it moistens it, and it pressurizes that air as it goes into our body. This regulates the heart rate and improves blood circulation and much more. And here's an interesting thing. Better blood circulation is associated with having more energy throughout the day. When you take in unprocessed air through your mouth, you get none of these benefits. Just stop right now and notice how you're breathing. Are you breathing through your mouth? Many of us do, especially during the night. Mouth breathing causes us to lose 40% more water, so we may wake up parched and dry, many of us not able to fall into a good, deep sleep. And ironically, even though your mouth is dry and you wake up thirsty, you may have to pee more, because when we have inadequate time in deep sleep, like with chronic sleep apnea, or excessive snoring, or trouble breathing in the night, our kidneys release water which triggers the need to urinate. So it's possible that improving our breathing could lead to a better night's sleep. Nestor explains how smell is life's oldest sense. Breathing is so much more than just getting air into our bodies. It's the most intimate connection to our surroundings. To breathe is to absorb into ourselves what surrounds us, taking in a little bit of life with each breath, taking in the air that's been split apart by sunlight, and then we give it back out. He says respiration is, at its core, reciprocation. So we don't breathe through the correct part of our body, and Nestor suggests that we might be breathing too much. It might be better to breathe 
less. When you take in fewer breaths per minute, you take in more carbon dioxide. Higher levels of carbon dioxide in the body are associated with greater oxygen absorption. The easiest way to build up carbon dioxide levels in your body is to breathe lighter and less frequently. So try this. Slow your breathing down. Right now, try breathing six breaths per minute. Take a breath through your nose and exhale two to three seconds longer than that breath in. Allow yourself to breathe in fewer times per minute. I know for me, when I was listening to this book on Audible, I practiced the technique in the car. I focused on breathing through my nose and doing longer exhales to extend out each breath. Esther tells us that the optimum breathing rate is about 5.5 breaths per minute. Interestingly, that's 5.5 second inhales and 5.5 second exhales. More than just increasing our carbon dioxide, exhaling slowly can help us relax and improve our organs. The book explains that when people follow this slow breathing pattern, blood flow to the brain increased and the systems in the body entered a state of coherence when the functions of the heart, circulation, and the nervous system were all coordinated to peak efficiency. Our heart rate slows down when we're exhaling, so exhaling is part of a parasympathetic response that's essential for conserving energy. Parasympathetic responses calms our mental state contrary to the sympathetic nervous system, which prepares us for fight or flight. Nestor tells us this, anxiety and shallow breathing are interlinked. People with panic attacks or obsessive compulsive disorders that are suffering from high anxiety constantly have low carbon dioxide levels and a much greater fear of holding their breath. But to avoid another attack, they breathe far too much. But then when they breathe too much, ironically, they don't get in enough carbon dioxide. So they're anxious because they're overbreathing, but then they're overbreathing because they're anxious. It's amazing the things that breath can help. So consider how when we're in a stress state or when we've experienced something that causes a lot of anxiety, the best thing to do is to take slow breaths. Another discovery, our lungs can be strengthened like muscles. There's examples of free divers who have trained their lungs to improve capacity. High endurance athletes train their lungs to be stronger. The book also talked about how people with lung disease were able to harness the power of the diaphragm, which is that muscle right underneath the lungs. Most adults don't exercise the full capacity of the diaphragm, and people with breathing problems use even less. So the book talks about a doctor who would use a breathing technique to help patients exercise their diaphragms properly. They would breathe slowly and he would massage different parts of their chest and the neck and the throat, helping them move more air with every breath, every time they exhaled. These patients didn't cure their emphysema or their lung disease because that was permanent, but they were able to access more parts of their lungs that were still healthy. Patients that were bedridden were able to get up and walk. Patients who struggled to talk were all of a sudden able to have a smooth conversation. Doctors always thought it wasn't possible to manipulate the diaphragm, and it was assumed that the lungs simply got weaker and weaker with age, gradually losing capacity. But this particular example shows the opposite. All of these health benefits are related to breathing through the nose, recognizing the way that we breathe, and attempting to use the diaphragm to access more of our lungs. Also, the pace at which we breathe. Breathing slower, leaving more carbon dioxide in the system. Esther talks about how so many kids are diagnosed with ADHD, allergies, asthma, and they're given so much medicine and so many drugs, surgeries to remove their tonsils, their adenoids, and a lot of it never works. You have the same problems over and over, and he's suggesting what we might just need to do is breathe better. So check in with yourself right now. Are you breathing through your mouth? Are you breathing through your nose? How long are your breaths? How conscious are you of the way that you breathe? The book is full of extreme stories about how breathing has had incredible effects. People surviving in freezing weather just with their breath, running half marathons in the Arctic without shoes or a shirt, hacking the autonomic nervous system. Many of these methods are controversial and they should not be treated lightly, but they do demonstrate the amazing things that breathing can do for our bodies. He even describes how breathing just through the left nostril shifts the blood flow to the opposite side of the prefrontal cortex, the right side that plays a role in creative thoughts and emotions. It really is incredible what our breath can do. 
This book has received its share of criticism, citing that it uses anecdotal evidence and it's pseudoscience. But I really encourage you to just consider the impact breathing can have on your health, on our bodies. Many ancient traditions have used the power of breath to great benefit. Nestor suggests that our Western medicine relies heavily on pills and modern interventions, often looking down on approaches where we can heal ourselves. Western medicine is reliant and proud of our interventions, and they are important, yet perhaps we're ignoring the most powerful intervention of all, our own body's ability to keep us healthy and well. So try breathing through your nose. Try breathing slower. Try breathing less. It just might change the way you feel. In all of our roles, being healthy, feeling strong, being emotionally grounded, being able to get calm when we feel like we are pushed to our edge, it's really important. I invite you to become more conscious of your breath. Thank you for taking the time with me, and I'll see you next time.